Hi, Founder fans. Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day. Today, we are discussing the top 13 most important founders from New Hampshire. Hi, Cookie. We are shooting live for those of you watching in the future, but uh, that's okay because we have a whole bunch of founders from New Hampshire to speak about. Right off the bat, I want to note, I did one on Massachusetts last week, and I did the top 13 most overlooked founders from Massachusetts. I was attempting to do the same thing today, but I realized that most of the founders from New Hampshire are overlooked. So I figured a top 13 at large founders from New Hampshire would be better than the overlooked ones because we'd be leaving out just like three or four people who we should give shout outs to. So without further ado, let's get into it. And the first founder, as we pop up over here, number 13 counting down and most important is Jonathan Moulton. Now, Jonathan Moulton's kind of an outlier. He is a fascinating person. I am great. Thank you, Alex. Jonathan Moulton is a fascinating person because there are several legends associated with his life. Now, in real life, he was on the frontier of New Hampshire, pretty successful, pretty wealthy, and he would eventually be a leading patriot and eventually is uh, put in the Massachusetts... Um, he's in the Massachusetts militia when the Revolutionary War breaks out, and he's put in charge of guarding Massachusetts's borders. And when I say Massachusetts, I mean New Hampshire. We're talking about New Hampshire today. What am I saying? Uh, he is put in charge of talking about... He's put in charge of New Hampshire's borders. Now, New Hampshire's border really was just the coast the, what, 13, 20 miles of coast it has on the ocean, but the threat of a British naval invasion was a real one, especially for a city like Portsmouth, which was a very important port in this time period, and, you know, still technically is. Uh, so, uh, Moulton is leading the men there. He serves throughout the war, goes home. He serves throughout, uh, sporadically on the local government, but Moulton is important because he builds lore for Massachusetts, for New Hampshire. I'm done saying Massachusetts. Uh, when we discuss this, there are several things that are important for founders to be on this list. Uh, were they important on the, at the federal level? Were they important at the state level? Were they important to the war effort during the Revolutionary War? Or were they important culturally? And Jonathan Moulton makes this list mostly for his cultural importance, despite having served in the war and being important to New Hampshire's estate. This is a picture of the devil next to me because there have been accusations that Jonathan Moulton made deals with the devil. In fact, there is a rumor that the way he made all this money on the frontier was that, well, the devil came and said, hey, I'll fill up a boot's worth of gold for you. And Moulton says, okay. And the devil leaves and he comes back and he says, okay, you ready for me to fill up your boot full of gold? And Moulton says, yeah. Here's my boot on the floor. Fill it up. And the devil fills it and fills it and fills it. And the, and the boot just never fills up. That's because, allegedly, Jonathan Moulton had cut a hole in the ground underneath the boot. And the devil wasn't just filling up his boot. He was filling up the entirety of his basement. <laughs> oh, allegedly, that's how it went down. And this isn't where it ends. So, I... Uh, Apparently, uh, at one point, Jonathan Moulton's spouse passes away. I do forget her name. I believe the one who passed away was Sarah. Uh, and he very quickly remarries another younger, we'll call her trophy wife, uh, because she was young and beautiful and he was a rich older man. And well, here we are filling up the boots. Uh, and then uh, not only does he marry another woman, but apparently he gives her his old wife's ring. And the first night they are sleeping together in their bed in their house, well, the ghost of his deceased wife allegedly shows up to take the ring back. Uh, apparently she was scared off and the ring stayed. But this is legend number two for Jonathan Moulton. Legend number three. Apparently, eventually, after his life is over, uh, Jonathan Moulton passes away, as human beings often do. He passes away, and at his funeral, his friends are carrying his casket, and he has a friend who wants to look in one more time just to see his old friend before they bury him. And they look in, and what happens? Well, there's no body there. It's just some gold. Apparently, one last trick 
with the devil or something of that nature. Either way, and I will say that these three stories I've told are legends and they have been told many different ways on many different occasions. So if you've heard a version of the story, let me know in the comments. Uh, I am not, I don't believe I'm wrong. You just may have heard a different version of these stories. So that's Jonathan Moulton. I thought we'd start off with someone fun. Um, Alex Flynn asking me, who was the Portsmouth founder who planted a tree after he returned home signing his de after signing the declaration? Uh, well, Alex, you'll have to wait on that till we get to that number because we've got 12 more to go. <laughs> Hopefully Yeaton is number 12. Hopefully Yeaton is another fun founder. He uh, serves in the war. He's mostly at the state level. Uh, throughout the war, and he serves uh, in the Continental Navy for a brief period. The reason hopefully Yeaton is on this list is after the United States Constitution was ratified and Alexander Hamilton takes over the Treasury Department, well, that department decides to create something known as the Revenue Cutter, the Marine Revenue. Uh, essentially, it was a police force on the seas, and it was its job was to make sure people were not doing what the Patriots did before the Revolution, which was smuggle things in. Hamilton's new federal government needed you to be paying taxes on your imports. Absolutely. Hopefully, Yeaton was the man put in charge of these. They were cutters. They were small boats that were meant to move quickly on the water to be able to catch up to other boats and essentially police them. The reason Yeaton is on this list is he is considered, in fact, by the post car, the by the Coast Guard as the father of the American Coast Guard, because the Revenue Marine that he was the first person put in charge of actually is the forerunner. It would combine with another uh, pol boat police force eventually in the early 1900s and create the Coast Guard. So hopefully Eaton is the father of the Coast Guard. It's not a whole lot about his life that's that, you know, riveting as compared to the aforementioned Jonathan Moulton, but uh, Yeaton is extremely important in naval policing when it comes to the United States federal government. Interestingly enough, he was actually ousted eventually by John Adams and then brought back by Thomas Jefferson, which doesn't usually feel like it makes a lot of sense, but uh, Adams famously got rid of every, all of Hamilton's guys at one point, so <laughs> we'll forgive him for that. Moving on. Matthew Thornton, and I struggled with putting him higher on this list. Uh, Matthew Thornton is one of the three signers of the Declaration of Independence, all of whom we will be hearing about this evening. Thornton uh, was moderately important to New Hampshire leading up to the Revolution. He made his way, he was a physician, he made his way up into local government while he was serving in local government. He gets put in charge of a committee of correspondence and then is elected chairman, kind of president, of the provincial government that's put in place during the early stages of the revolution. And as such, he oversees the first steps of the revolution and helps oversee the creation of Massachusetts first New Hampshire's, sorry, New Hampshire's first uh, constitution. He then goes to the Continental Congress. He then signs the Declaration of Independence goes back to New Hampshire, where he is important in local politics. Uh, not really the most important person, but he becomes a pamphleteer of sorts, and he writes justifications for the revolution to the people of New Hampshire, uh, which become very popular at the time. Getting into the top 10. Josiah Bartlett. Josiah Bartlett is a lot of fun. You've probably heard me mention numerous times that he is the namesake of Martin Sheen's character on the West Wing, President Bartlett, on that particular show. And whether or not that show is your cup of tea, it's still nice to have a founder get recognized in modern popular culture to any degree, especially a random like Josiah Bartlett. Now, Josiah Bartlett was very interesting. He was a self-taught physician at a time where most of the founders we discussed went over to Europe to get their education or are one of the early students at the College of Philadelphia that had the first medical school in the future United States. Josiah Bartlett simply does what most doctors did at the time. He apprenticed to another doctor and studied under some other guy. And then at 20 years old, hung up a shingle and said, I'm a doctor now. And people were like, okay. And they went to him and it worked out. And he does this for like 45, 50 years. Uh, and even uh, skipping ahead, 
much. His sons join him. He has 10 children, three of whom are sons. They all become physicians. Seven of his grandsons become physicians. And when one of his children graduate, I believe it was Dartmouth, who was an early medical student at Dartmouth, gets his medical degree. Josiah Bartlett gives the commence commencement speech, and he is then, after 50 years of practice, awarded an honorary doctorate of medicine a few years before he passes away. Going back, though, uh, early on in his practice of medicine, there was a bilious fever that broke out in his community, and people were dying from it. But he discovered that Peruvian bark could stave off the ailment for enough time for the body to recover from it. So he actually uh, has a little bit of a medical breakthrough that's totally unsung and unappreciated, and with modern medicine, not used at all today, but at the time, it was a very important uh, introduction and understanding of this particular disease. Now, as the revolution approaches, Barla becomes an outspoken founder. He spent many decades in the local and state or colonial governments leading up to the revolution, and he is actually chosen to go to the First Continental Congress, but declines because he does not want to travel that far. At that point, he has family to take care of. That being said, by the time the Second Continental Congress comes around, the revolution is broken out and Josiah Bartlett does accept appointment and he goes and he is the second signer of the Declaration of Independence we will discuss today. He also sticks around for the signing of the Articles of Confederation. He actually leaves and then comes back for the signing of the Articles of Confederation, after which he leaves the national stage for the rest of his career, goes back to state politics, becomes a justice on the New Hampshire Supreme Court, eventually becomes chief justice of that court, and then ends up becoming uh, president of New Hampshire. New Hampshire went through a few constitutions real quick. Uh, while he's president of New Hampshire, the state creates a another constitution, the pretty much the one they're living under still to this day, and he oversees the implementation of that constitution, and he oversees the transition into this new government. So he goes from being the last president of New Hampshire to being the first governor of New Hampshire, though the positions are essentially interchangeable. Furthermore, he was a uh, delegate to the, Constitu the ratification convention for the United States Constitution, where not only did he support the new government, but he actually sat as chairperson on several occasions overseeing that particular debate. Uh, passes away a few years later, just after he resigns or declines to run for governor one final time. Josiah Bart. So, Enoch Poor. Let's talk about Enoch Poor. So, this gentleman was born and raised in Massachusetts, but ends up moving as an adult to New Hampshire after serving in the French and Indian War. Now, when we talked about Massachusetts, when we spoke about Massachusetts last week, we didn't talk about a whole lot of soldiers. Uh, again, that video was underappreciated founders, and the soldiers from Massachusetts usually get their due. Uh, Enoch Poor was a soldier, fought in the French and Indian War. Uh, afterwards, ends up making a career for himself in New Hampshire. And then just as the American Revolution breaks out, he's already serving in the New Hampshire militia. And once the Battle of Lexington and Concord takes place, well, New Hampshire wants to send some help. They send three regiments of people. Uh, one is led by Enoch Poor. Uh, another is led by a person we're going to get to. And a third one, I do want to give a shout out here, is to a gentleman named James Reed. Now, James Reed actually would also, like Enoch Poor, uh, go and serve at the Battle of Bunker Hill, then go serve in the campaign... Uh, to invade Canada up in Quebec. And while Reed would survive that particular battle, he was one of the many, many people who got smallpox during the retreat from Canada. And he would go blind. And just as he went blind was when word arrived that James Reed had been promoted to Brigadier General. And unfortunately, he was never able to take up that command because he suffered from blindness for the remainder of a pretty long life, and he goes back home. Now, Poor also goes at the same time to Lexi uh, Massachusetts, serves in the Battle of Bunker Hill, goes up, serves in the failed invasion of Canada, uh, comes down and retreats. After, J after James Reed passes away, Enoch Poor is then the New Hampshire man who is promoted to Brigadier General. Uh, this is a little bit later, uh, 17, early 1777. Uh, after that, he serves... He's one of the people who, with Arthur St. Clair, retreats 
from Fort Ticonderoga as Johnny Burgoyne is leading the British down the Hudson. But Poor serves in the Battle of Saratoga, the several battles of Saratoga. And if you read about him, most of what you read about is the Battle of Saratoga. And uh, he did a lot of good things there. He was a, a real asset to winning that particular engagement. After this, he joins the Sullivan Clinton campaign, a cor uh, another New Hampshire person, wink, wink, uh, goes across upstate New York, uh, routing out the Native Americans in that part of the area because of the uh, what the Americans perceived kind of rightfully as atrocities that had been committed at the time. Not that the atrocities weren't going back and forth in upstate New York. We're not going to get too much into upstate New York today, but the area I live was certainly mayhem for a little bit there. Uh, either way, Poor then joins the Continental Army as they travel down to New Jersey. And this is where he dies suddenly. Now, the doctor's report says he passed away of typhus, and George Washington does attend his funeral and writes to the Continental Congress with glowing reviews about Enoch Poor and what he was capable of as a general. But there has been, in the last few decades, some questions about Enoch Poor's life. Now, I'm not going to claim I know what happened, and, and I should elaborate. When I say his life, I mean his death. Because the doctor's report says typhus, the Continental Army agreed on typhus, but there are some signs that point to he was kind of disagreeable at times, and he may or may not have gotten into a little bit of a conflict with one of his inferior officers, and he may or may not have engaged in a duel with one of his supporting officers that he lost, and there may or may not have been a cover-up because Commander Washington and the rest of the leaders of the Continental Army found it extraordinarily ungentlemanly for a commanding officer to engage in a duel with one of his inferior officers. And not only to save Enoch Poor's reputation, but to save the reputation of the Continental Army at large, there may or may not have been a cover-up to make sure that a brigadier general losing a duel with a captain never saw the light of day. Now, again, I'm not trying to claim whether or not that's true. It may simply be conspiracy, but it's been floated over the last several decades that that is what happened. And I wanted to put it out there because it's a fun story. Moving right along. Prince Whipple. Now, we had a question earlier about the uh, declaration signer who came and saw and planted a liberty tree. So, just to be clear, Prince Whipple is not that person. And we don't have an image of Prince Whipple. This is uh, an image of a black patriot. And Prince Whipple was a black patriot. Now, William Whipple is a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And I almost put both names here because their stories go hand in hand. And I've told these stories on several occasions, but I really love this story. Uh, it's extraordinarily inspirational, and it, and it kind of embodies what the American Revolution, the ideals, the very difficult-to-achieve ideals of the American Revolution were about. Prince Whipple came over to the United States on a boat. He, as the story goes, was part of a wealthy family that was sending their son over to North America to get an education. This is hard to verify, but what we do know is he was taken prisoner by the ship owner and sold into slavery in Maryland. Now, as far as being sold into slavery in the late colonial period of American history is concerned, uh, Prince Whipple was as, we'll say, lucky as you're going to get for a person being sold into slavery, which is not something I'm trying to make light of, of course, uh, but as opposed to moving to the plantations of the South, he was brought into the household of William Whipple. William Whipple lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He was a merchant. Uh, he came from a fairly wealthy family, but had made most of his money on his own. Prince was the one and only slave he owned. Prince lived in his house and was treated much like women were treated at the time in New England, uh, which was like a child, unfortunately. That being said, Prince lived in the house with William. He was educated. He learned to do the books of their merchant firm. And they essentially did everything together. They were colleagues, and Whipple was more or less, Prince was more or less treated like William's son. 
once the American Revolution starts going, William Whipple is sent to the Continental Congress, and he is at the First Continental Congress where he signs the Declaration of Independence. Prince Whipple accompanied him there. Now, while Prince most certainly was not in the room while they were discussing the Declaration and signing the Declaration, he certainly would have been in the meal halls and taverns and inns where the ideals of the Declaration and the ideals of the fight for independence were being discussed. And he would have been exposed to the ideas of liberty and freedom firsthand, uh, having traveled all the way from New Hampshire to Philadelphia to do so. Afterward, he would return with William to their home in Philadelphia. And this is what Alex was referencing before. Together, they would plant a liberty tree, which stands to this day outside the Moffat Lad House, as it's called, but was William Whipple's property at the time. Now, the irony of having your slave plant your liberty tree is not lost on me, and it wasn't lost on William or Prince either. Now, we'll get to that in a second, but I do want to note that they went together, William being appointed a, brig a brigadier general in the militia. Prince also goes and is serving with William at the Battle of Saratoga. They, neither of them really serve. He is assistant to, you know, as a secretary, a servant to the general. Uh, and usually generals aren't getting their hands all that dirty, uh, though there were bullets everywhere. Either way, they then return to New Hampshire, where they become leaders in the local community. As for Prince, he is, after about two years, he is, we'll say, permitted by William. There are 20 or so slaves that petition the New Hampshire state government for independence. Prince is one of the signatories on this position, uh, on this petition to eliminate slavery in the state of New Hampshire. We don't know who wrote the petition, but it's very well written and it talks much like the Declaration of Independence does. And a majority of historians seem to agree that because of Prince's exposure to talk of liberty and freedom in Philadelphia and his ability to write at a certain level, having been essentially secretary and bookkeeper for William's merchant firm, many people seem to think that Prince Whipple is the one who actually wrote this petition. Uh, and again, he was one of the signatories on it. Now, at this time, New Hampshire was going through one of several constitutional changes and therefore, they kind of cast aside the petition for independence for the slaves of New Hampshire, and nothing really comes of it. That being said, the Whipple family, and not just William, but also his brother Joseph, uh, they first grant their slaves, so Prince is first granted the rights of a free man which means he can carry on, carry on around New Hampshire as he sees fit, as if he was free, though he is still owned by William Whipple. Now, while this doesn't seem great at the time, if you recall, no one's going to kidnap a slave if they're owned by someone else. And it was kind of a safety measure that no one's going to steal from William Whipple. If Prince Whipple was a free man, they might kidnap him. But if he's owned technically by William Whipple, no one's going to steal that property. So this was William's way of offering freedom to Prince without simply casting him out on his own. Now, that being said, a few years later, on the day he gets married to a woman named Dinah, who we'll talk about in a second, uh, Prince is granted freedom entirely, not just the rights of a free man. Because by this point, New Hampshire's perspective on uh, slavery has grown to such a point that no one really respects the institution anymore. Interestingly, I don't know that New Hampshire ever actually outlawed slavery. It just kind of went away. Now, that's not to say that over the last few centuries there haven't been racial tensions in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I'm not trying to make that claim. But at the time, coming out of the American Revolution, that seemed to be the prevailing attitude, where everyone simply liberated their slaves. And most of the people who could actually offer property or some kind of compensation to their slaves. So, for example, Prince here, after having helped plant William plant the Liberty Tree and been an important, the employee to his business, essentially, for decades, uh, William does offer Prince some property next door and uh, helps him build a house. Even after he's liberated, Prince continues to go back and work now as an employee with William Whipple. 
during this time, uh, Prince, as I said, he marries a woman named Dana, Dinah, who was a free woman of color in New Hampshire, and she starts a school for children of color to help educate uh, the black children of the area who are coming, whose parents were slaves, so not everyone was as fortunate to be educated as uh, Prince and certain other slaves who, as I mentioned, signed the document petitioning for freedom in New Hampshire. Either way, they form kind of the heart of a burgeoning free black community in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And and the reason I think Prince Whipple in particular deserves to be recognized as the eighth most important founder from New Hampshire is because his contribution directly and indirectly, uh, not only to the war and to helping William uh, sign the declaration, but culturally and the, the, the growth of the mind of the person, the peoples living in New Hampshire at large. Uh, William's efforts really reflected on that change, and it's hard to overlook that. And again, this is a period of time where Pennsylvania had just uh, eliminated slavery. Massachusetts was just going through the process of recognizing that its constitution had accidentally eliminated slavery, <laughs> and uh, New Hampshire is right along with them on the forefront of it. And again, as I said, to the point where New Hampshire never actually makes slavery illegal, they just kind of stop, and Whipple, Prince Whipple really represents that. Continuing on, number eight, uh, number seven, and number six, it's a two-for-one package with this, the Gilman Brothers. So if you go to the Gilman House right now, it is currently under the moniker the Museum of the American Revolution uh, in Exeter, New Hampshire, and it's a really great place. I've been there, and it's the house they grew up in, although I do believe it's been relocated across town over the centuries. Being said, these two brothers played a gigantic role in both the growth of New Hampshire as a state and the United States as a government. One of these two brothers signs the Constitution. Now, they're a little bit younger when the war breaks out, but they do both join the Continental Army. They follow their father into joining. Uh, John Taylor joins the state militia. They both join the state militia. Actually, Nicholas Gilman joins another person we'll be talking about at number five uh, as his number two, as his adjutant general. And I, I made a video about Nicholas recently. So they both serve in the war. Nicholas uh, helps do the administration of the Continental Army. Uh, after the war wraps up, they both go into local and in politics. Eventually, uh, first John Taylor goes to the Continental Congress for a year. Then a few years later, Nicholas goes to, excuse me, the Continental Congress as well. While Nicholas is in the Continental Congress, he's sent to the Constitutional Convention. He helps create the United States government and then goes back to New York because he's still serving in the Continental Congress. And John Taylor and Nicholas essentially lead the path to get ratification co accomplished in the state of New Hampshire. In fact, John Taylor is one of the people who can really be credited with ushering New Hampshire into the Union. And I'll remind you that it was when New Hampshire joined the Union that the ninth state ratified and the government became officially the government. Now, not long after this, Nicholas, I actually forgot to mention earlier when we talked about Josiah Bartlett, Josiah Bartlett was one of the first two people appointed to the United States Senate representing New Hampshire. Uh, Josiah Bartlett turns it down because he's an old man. And in his place, Nicholas Gilman is chosen at a time where the states chose senators. They didn't vote on them. So Nicholas Gilman, now having signed the Constitution, is an inaugural senator from the great state of New Hampshire. Just a few years later, he serves throughout most of the 1790s. And just a few years later, John Taylor Gilman is elected as governor of New Hampshire. And he spends over a decade in that position. So throughout the 1790s, uh, John Taylor Gilman is creating the state, and Nicholas Gilman is creating the federal government. And one of them signed the Constitution. Not much more to say about him, a lot more to say about him, but I, I spoke about the Gilmans recently, so we'll move right on to Alexander Scammell. Now, as I said, there's a lot of different ways that we can consider these founders very important. And Alexander Scammell's primarily for the uh, war effort itself. Scammell joins the... Uh, militia as a young man he serves in the battle of fort william and mary which we'll talk a little bit more about later with some other founders but he serves as the number two to another founder when they go across the water and pretty easily take a poorly manned fort because paul revere just showed up and said the british are coming this is a few months before lexington and concord uh the british didn't really come this time but they thought they would so they went in and took all the gunpowder and cannons scammell then is uh after the war begins, he is put in charge of a regiment of soldiers who go off to assist in the effort. This is not the first wave. This is the second wave of soldiers that go off. 
The aforementioned Nicholas Gilman is his adjutant general. They work together. He serves uh, in several battles in the northern part of the war before being promoted at Valley Forge by George Washington to become adjutant general of the Continental Army. An adjutant general is more or less the HR department of an army. They oversee the business, the administering of an army. And Scammell ran the business part of the American Revolution for several years, all the way up until the Battle of Yorktown, when unfortunately... He is killed in an early skirmish before the siege really gets underway at Yorktown. And he passes away. And it's a huge loss for the army. Uh, Washington is saddened by it. It's at several, I've seen at least three founders name their children Alexander Scammell blank for their last name. Like Henry Dearborn, Alexander, Hamel, Alexander Scammell Dearborn. Uh, I think there's Alexander Scammell Wadsworth. There's several people named their sons after this man. So he's really made an impression on everyone. And there's one other thing about him I actually I skipped over. Uh, famously, Benedict Arnold was uh, found treasonous. And the reason they found him out was they captured John Andre when he was leaving their meeting. John, major John Andre, the British major, was convicted of being a spy and hung. And the person in charge of his hanging was Alexander Scammell. He's the one who hung... Ah, uh, Mr. Benedict Arnold. So that's uh, that's all that's fun. So that's also very important, obviously. Moving on, keep moving on right along here. John Stark. So if there is a name you know and you like warfare, General John Stark is probably the person who you are familiar with. He serves in the militia. He is one of the three people with the aforementioned Enoch Poor and ja uh, James Reed that is given command of a battalion and sent from New Hampshire to help after Lexington and Concord. He is very important to the Battle of Bunker Hill. And then he continues to be important throughout the Northeast during the Revolution. Now, he has his conflicts with the Continental Army. He never actually joined the Continental Army, I don't believe. Uh, he likes to stay with the militia. He wants to stay in New Hampshire. He does leave New Hampshire for the Battle of Bennington, which he's most famous for. The Battle of Bennington was just essentially an outlying part of the Battle of Saratoga. It was just a few days beforehand uh, over, I think it was technically in New York, though the lines were questionable at the time. In fact, he may very well have gone into Vermont because he could have rightfully believed it was part of New Hampshire. Could have rightfully believed it was part of New York and could have rightfully believed it was an independent nation of Vermont at the time. Either way, John Stark goes over and serves the Battle of Bennington. It's what he's most famous for, though he does serve many different battles. Now, he is a Cincinnatus of sorts, kind of like George Washington considered himself, where after the war was over, he went home and left politics. Just altogether. Just stayed to himself. I couldn't read or write very well, I'm under the impression, but he is promoted to Brigadier General. He does live a very long time, and I believe the year was 1809 when they have a, a meeting in his honor essentially uh thanking him for his service but he was too ill to travel to the meeting instead he sends a note and the last line of the note reads live free or die dying is not the worst of evils and you know what i should pull this out he said this live free or die general john stark that is now the state motto, of New, state motto of New Hampshire. So if not for nothing else, as we said, there are many things that could make a founder important. Given a state, its motto makes you pretty important to that state. General John Stark. we we'll take a quick sip of water before we get to our top three. Now, while you guys may know many of the names I've said, even in passing, these are all underappreciated. Everyone from New Hampshire is underappreciated. You may know many of these names in passing. The next name you've probably never heard of, but I consider him at least the number three most important founder in the state of New Hampshire during the Revolution, if not the most important to New Hampshire. And that person is Meshech Weir. No known image. Uh, this is an... I will explain this in a second. Meshech Weir was older than most of the revolutionaries in Massachusetts, and he was New Hampshire, I apologize, older than most of the revolutionaries in New Hampshire, and honestly, 
probably the most important. So, Mashinj Weir, he is in politics for a long time, well before the revolution begins. And back in the 1760s, there were a whole bunch of different reasons, different parts of different colonies wanted to revolt against the king. There was a problem called the Pine Tree Riots in the 1760s. And that's essentially what the image next to me is. There's a man on a horse, and he's pointing at the tree. And if you look at the tree, right about here, there's a little mark. Looks like a little arrow on that tree. That's the king's insignia. Excuse me. That's the king's insignia. Now, it probably didn't look just like that. This is an image. But uh, as I correct my camera... Oh, no. Okay, I'm a little blurry. Time out. Give me one sec. I don't want to be blurry. I have to pull myself back up to fix the blurry, and then we're going to get right back into Machine Schweer. Here we go. Perfect. Looking good. Great. Grand. As good as I'm ever going to get. Let's get right back here to Machech. Machech, I believe it's pronounced. So, the Pine Tree Riots. At the time, the king would send his men out into the woods on private property, mind you, and find the biggest trees with the best uh, middle of the tree. Bark, not bark. The The trunk the best trunks because new hampshire was known but still probably is for its lumber and the they wanted big solid trees to make the main mast of a ship with and the king would send men out to go through and mark off the trees he wanted the thing is if you owned property and you sold it for lumber you wanted the best trees on your property so you could sell them for building ships but the king would come in and have his men mark off your trees. And a bunch of people said, forget that, and they cut down the trees and sold them. The king was not pleased, as you might imagine, and several people were put on trial and convicted of stealing the king's property. Now, Meshach Weir, by this point, had made his way. He was older. So he made his way up the ranks and was already on the colonial Supreme Court at this point. So, Meshach handed down what he saw as just crimes, which were very small fines that were easily affordable by anyone who was convicted of the crime. He did this because, like the people who cut down the trees, he thought this was fooey and disagreed with it. This made him an instant leader of the Patriots, and an instant enemy of the crown. So, a decade or so later, when the American Revolution breaks out, the aforementioned Matthew Thornton helped create the first constitution, but the first constitution of New Hampshire was very strange. It essentially put was a unicameral legislature, which means it was just a Congress. And the Congress would make all the laws, and they had a committee of safety, now, the committees of safety had broken out throughout the colonies, and they were generally simply in charge of the war effort, the underground war effort throwing a revolution. But in New Hampshire, they put the committee of safety essentially in, it was a subset of Congress, but it was in it was the executive branch. Machen Weir was put in charge of this, uh, so therefore, also, whenever Congress was not in session, the Committee of Safety was just in charge of everything. So Machen Weir was more or less acting governor, and when Congress was out of session, dictator of New Hampshire. Additionally, he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, so he was literal judge, jury, and executioner. Fortunately, he was a patriot, so, and uh, the loyalist. There was not a, the loyalist sentiment in New Hampshire was always fairly small com compared to other colonies. Uh, they pretty quickly ran down to Massachusetts or went up to Canada. But from 1776 until 1782, pretty much the entirety of the war effort, Machinch Weir was in charge of New Hampshire. He was the guy running. All of it. Oh, and I forgot to mention, when Congress was in session, you know, I said Congress was in charge when it was in session. Oh, who was who was presiding officer of that Congress? Meshech Weir. So Meshech Weir was head of the legislative branch, head of the executive branch, 
and head of the judicial branch of New Hampshire for the better part of six years, during essentially the entirety of the American Revolutionary War. Uh, unfortunately, a few years later, he uh, passes away, uh, having been pretty old. He was pretty close to Ben Franklin's age, so he lived a very long time. He was in his, I believe he was in his 80s. Yeah, he was like 81 or 82 when he passes away in 1784. So, Mr. Weir is a name no one's ever heard of, despite being extraordinarily important to both the war effort and the development of early Massachusetts. It's in 1784. He leaves just as they get come up with their second constitution, which is the one they were creating earlier when we discussed Prince Whipple trying to petition for uh, freedom for black people in New Hampshire. They were creating their second government, and then it was a few years later, uh, six years later, under Josiah Bartlett, who we discussed, where they created their third and final constitution, which reflects the one that they have today. So, I'm going to do another sip of water real quick, because we have two founders left. Let's see if we can't guess the names. So, number the second, and this was a really hard decision between the two, but I, I have a justification as to why I went the way I did. John Sullivan. So John Sullivan was amazingly important to the revolution. Uh, he was part of the Battle of William and Mary, who he went in and grabbed some of the stuff. That actually took place after he had already gone to the First Continental Congress. He was one of two New Hampshireites to have gone to the First Continental Congress. He signed the uh, Continental Association, which was the initial boycott on goods. That was the result of the First Continental Congress. He also signed the Declaration of Rights and Grievances, which was the other result, uh, which essentially was the complaints they sent to the king. He goes back to New Hampshire, helps arm it. He returns to the Continental Congress, 1775, where he was quickly appointed a general in the Continental Army. Uh, he serves through a good portion of the war. He goes, he has, he goes, he serves in the uh, I don't, I will get it. I want to get it in the right order. We're talking about the war here. Uh, he's serving with the army. He serves in New York. Eventually, he crosses over to what? Uh, 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 what is it called? Staten Island? Uh, no, not Staten Island. That's where the meeting is. He's actually captured at one point. He's kind of blamed by the Continental Army. He's one of many generals who takes a lot of trash and uh, trash talking from the Continental Congress. And despite doing everything right, essentially. Word gets back to the Continental Congress and party politics makes things very tough on him. He goes, uh, he gets captured. When he gets out, he is freed because he is told to go to the Continental Congress and, and ask for a meeting, uh, a diplomatic meeting to see if a treaty or a truce can't be decided between the Continental Congress and the uh, uh, Howe brothers leading the British forces at the time that leads to the uh, tree the the Staten Island Peace Conference, which doesn't work out. But that's a famous one where it's Edward Rutledge, John Adams, and Ben Franklin, and John Adams and Ben Franklin share a room, and one of them's cold and one of them's hot. So one gets up and opens the window, and goes back to sleep. The other one gets up and closes it, goes back to sleep, and that goes on all night long. That famous story. That's a result of John uh, Sullivan being captured and sent back. Sullivan then goes and he joins the, he leads the failed Battle of Rhode Island. Again, he gets a lot of crap for that from the Continental Congress, but he did his best. He did what he could with what he had. He then is the leader of the Sullivan-Clinton campaign, which we referenced earlier, where he leads the sweeping movement across upstate New York, routing out all the Native Americans who there's only really one battle because the Native Americans flee before he gets there because he's coming out to do some stomping. Uh, they burn down a bunch of the villages. Unfortunately, historically, it is looked at as <sighs> he doesn't just slaughter people. He slaughters their burns, their villages, and he destroys their cattle. He slaughters a lot of their cattle, but the, the Native Americans themselves had already evacuated by this point. It does cause a humanitarian crisis uh, in Canada because they flee to the British who said they would help. Uh, but either way, it is looked as amazing success for the Continental Army. Still, he gets a lot of crap from Continental Congress. Uh, and then he leaves the army, eventually very disappointed, as many generals did because the Continental Congress was not cool to their generals. Either way, he then is elected back to the Continental Congress. And he is in the room making decisions with the very people he was not very pleased with, though those people start leaving and the next generation starts coming in. 
Sullivan then returns to local politics. He, uh, in 1786, becomes the third governor of New Hampshire. During this time, there is a thing called the Paper Money Riots. And the Paper Money Riots are essentially the same thing at the same time as Shays' Rebellion down in Massachusetts. A uh, bunch of veteran soldiers getting their land foreclosed on because it's not like they don't, aren't, don't have businesses. Their farms could make money, but there was literally no money there to buy the goods they were, the food they were growing. So they were like, what are we supposed to do? Why don't you print some paper money so we have some money so that the economy can work? And uh, the people leading it did not like that. So actually, a bunch of veteran soldiers in the state militia marched on the Capitol at Exeter at that time. John Sullivan had just become governor. He stepped out of the building and says, stop it. And the soldiers, despite the Continental Congress not loving John Sullivan, the soldiers very much did. And they had tremendous respect. So he said, why don't you guys go camp uh, half a mile up the road. I'll talk to the assembly here. We'll see if we can't work out something for you. And they said, okay, thanks, John. And they left. And then Sullivan called in the rest of the militia and went and just chased them out the next morning. Uh, and that ended pretty quickly. Uh, the, the few people who were, the, the leaders were tried, but I'm pretty sure they were. I think, I'm pretty sure Sullivan pardoned them. He then leaves office. Oh, no, I'm sorry. He was sitting governor of New Hampshire when he goes... Nope, I'm confusing him with the next person. He's there for two years, leaves office for number one, and then two years later is again elected governor. No, no, I'm sorry. A year and a half later. I'll explain why when we talk about our next person. But he leaves for just a year and a half, then comes back to become governor, uh, and then, I believe, does he serve... Uh, no, he then becomes a, a court, a United States District Court for the District of New Hampshire. George Washington, that's right, appoints him as an inaugural federal judge overseeing the entirety of New Hampshire when it comes to federal laws. And with that, we move on to, I guess you can only call him, numero uno, John Langdon. John Langdon is the American Revolution in New Hampshire. He is uh, not at the First Continental Congress. He does actually also participate in the Battle of William and Mary, taking over that fort. He then goes to... He goes back home. And then they send him to the Second Continental Congress. He's in the Second Continental Congress until June of 1776. Once independence looks inevitable, many of the people in the Continental Congress leave. The Patriots, the ones who don't want to support independence, stay around and they leave later in the summer. But many people either leave just before independence is voted for or either just after independence is voted for. Many of the people who made independence happen didn't actually sign the declaration on August 2nd, 1776. Most of the leaders had already left to go back to their home states and fight the war because now they had to win it. There was no more option. Langdon's one of these people. He goes back to New Hampshire and he oversees the construction of about a half dozen ships that join the Continental Army and fight, including uh, John Paul Jones's flagship, whose name uh, eludes me right now. So uh, really important to the actual creation of the Continental Navy itself. Uh, he then does go back to, uh, let me see, I know I have it here. He does return to the Continental Congress uh, later on in 1787, but he becomes quickly one of the leaders of New Hampshire. And in fact, John Langdon is after Meshench Weir, who we discussed before, was longtime governor. Uh, after they create their second constitution, Langdon becomes the first governor or the second governor of New Hampshire, what they called at the time president of New Hampshire. He would serve on and off for the next 25 years. Um, he and John Sullivan. So just to put this out there, Langdon serves for a year. He's replaced by Sullivan, who serves for two years. He's replaced by Langdon, who serves for a year and a half. He's replaced by Sullivan, who serves for a year. Uh, then Josiah Bartlett shows up, who we mentioned before, who was number 10. Then number seven, John Taylor Gilman shows up. 
And then in 1805, 16 years after the last time he was president of New Hampshire, now that another new constitution there, he, John Langdon, is again made governor of New Hampshire. Uh, he serves for four years in that position, then leaves for a year, and then is again elected governor of New Hampshire uh, for two more years. Um, and by the way, after that, it's William Plummer, then John Taylor Gilman again, and then William Plummer again. So they kept rotating the same guys in New Hampshire for quite a while there. Just to recap, uh, Langdon served as governor one, two, three, four times, uh, 1785 to 86, 88 to 89, then 1805 to 09, then 1810 to 12. Now, what did he do in the interim? Well, while he, uh, while his buddy was serving, well, Sullivan had been serving of governor in 1787, John Langdon goes to the uh, Constitutional Convention and helps write and sign the United States Constitution. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And then that whole gap in there, the 1790s, he wasn't serving as governor. Why wouldn't he be governor? He was so good at governor. Oh, it's because he was an inaugural member of the United States Senate and he served for 12 years from through the Washington and Adams entirety of president until Jefferson comes around when he goes back to New Hampshire. And that's what puts him over John Sullivan to be number one. It's the signing of the Constitution that Sullivan didn't have. And though Sullivan served twice as governor, Langdon served four times over the course of 30 years, 25 years. Making, in my subjective opinion, <laughs> John Langdon the most important founder from New Hampshire. Not only did he have a huge role in creating New Hampshire, but he had a huge role in creating the United States Constitution and a long time serving inaugural member of the United States Senate. And additionally, lastly, he also had an effect on the culture. Uh, as I said, one of the things that could get you on this list is the culture. During he, when he was in Philadelphia serving as a senator, one of George Washington's slaves, owned a judge, ran away. And she ran to New Hampshire. And Washington sent, uh, uh, through mediary, someone to try and reclaim her. And Langdon knew where she was. She had stayed in his house and knew his daughter. And he hid her and did not give her up. Again, as we were discussing with Prince Whipple earlier, the feelings about slavery in New Hampshire had long been changing and with the ideals of the Declaration of Independence had been extraordinarily radicalized. Where this twice former governor and twice future governor also, current, law, current serving senator of the United States, hid one of George Washington's slaves from him. Not in his house, but he knew her whereabouts and he kept them secret. Which, again, influences the culture as well as the politics of the state. Uh, John Langdon is a fascinating character. Uh, I didn't even bring up his brother Woodbury Langdon, which is a great name I love, who like kind of sneaks back into the United States during the revolution uh, and is held, but is like, I'm not a patriot. Why would I be a patriot? And they're like, okay, you can go. And he's like, yeah, serves in the Continental Congress. <laughs> that's the Langdon family, and that's John Langdon. So if you guys have any questions, as always, let me know. I sure hope you enjoyed this video. I enjoyed making it for you. Uh, it's, it's, it's fun making these lists, putting them together, uh, putting up the graphics isn't so much fun. That's a little tedious, but other than that, it's a great time. So I will be back as always. If you want to support the channel, check out the Patreon page. Tomorrow is Sunday, every Sunday at seven. We do a live video for Patriots over on Patreon. If you'd like to join us, uh, help me offset some of the costs of r running this operation. I would be eternally grateful. I am your humble and obedient servant, and I'll be back with another founder for you very soon.